During a rainstorm on the morning of October 22, 1968, in the Atlantic Ocean, the United States completed one of its most remarkably successful tests yet of man and machine in space. But this was only the ending. It was on a clear morning almost 11 days earlier at the Kennedy Space Center's launch pad 34 in Florida that we witnessed the beginning of the first manned mission in the United States Apollo program to land astronauts on the moon. The purpose of the flight of Apollo 7 could be stated very simply. Prove that the spacecraft command and service modules would function properly in space long enough to carry men to the moon and back. Accomplishing this was considerably less simple. It meant showing that a brand new spacecraft, far more complicated than its predecessors, would operate so well it could be trusted to take men well beyond near-Earth orbit. The astronauts were spacecraft commander Walter Schirra and pilots Don Isley and Walter Cunningham. The Kennedy Space Center had spent long days in preparation and checkout, working toward a launch time which had been set for months. It was not by chance that Apollo 7 lifted off only two and three quarter minutes after the appointed moment. Marshall Space Flight Center had spent years directing development and testing of the Saturn 1B launch vehicle, and it was not by chance that Apollo 7 was placed almost exactly on its planned trajectory into orbit about the Earth. Your God speed, Apollo 7. Thrust is okay. Roll, Very early in the flight, the general pattern of go for Apollo 7 was established in a conversation between the spacecraft and mission control at the manned spacecraft center in Houston, Texas. Right on the old button. Very good. Flight booster. Yeah. We appear we may be slightly marginal on the locks. We'll keep Okay, stand by. Cut off. J2, cut off. Beautiful. Fido. Flight photo work go. Go all across the board. CMC looks good, flight. 25553. Five, H dot is minus four balls one. Across the board. Seven, uh, we have you go for orbit here. Go for orbit. Apollo 7 was also go for an exhaustive series of tests of its worthiness in space. One of the first things which had to be learned was whether the astronauts could control the spacecraft combined with the S-4B Saturn stage. A very similar thing would have to be done during the early phases of a lunar mission. The answer was not long in coming. Three, two, one, mark. S-4B test complete. Beautiful. That was outstanding. Ah, real fine. Outstanding. Next, the spacecraft and S-4B stage were separated. The question now was whether the astronauts could turn their spacecraft around and control it to the degree required for future physical link-ups with equipment in space. For this, too, would have to be done in the lunar flight. And again, the answer was yes. Was a little flight just like Germany? Something that will not be seen in the lunar flight or in any other forthcoming Apollo mission were the panels at the top of the S-4B stage. They will simply be jettisoned in the future, but they drew comment in Apollo 7. And the small panel at the top, left, and bottom are opened uh, at, I would just be about a 45 degree angle, and the small panel on the right is just opened to maybe uh, 30 degrees at the very best. Uh, roger. Looks like you're looking at a four-jawed angry alligator. 
Apollo 7 escorted its spent S-4B stage through space for perhaps 30 minutes, then departed. That's the bigger one, Tom. Ready now? Yes, sir. Move out, yeah. It's absolutely beautiful here. The following day, Apollo 7 burned its spacecraft propulsion system for the first two times in the mission and returned to its four-jawed alligator, which was now angrier than ever. Apollo 7, Houston, uh, how close are you now? We close to about, uh, oh, about 70 feet. It's tumbling rather wildly, so we just have to stay away from it. All right, you understand. We can copy that, though. Okay, separate. In this maneuver, Apollo 7 had accomplished the first rendezvous of the program, and in so doing, had proven capable of meeting still another requirement for lunar flight. 1618. Plus one, two, two, one. Then, as we were to see in some of the most dramatic film ever returned from space, the crew would settle down to a weightless life in a spacecraft with four times more room than Gemini. There would be a host of other tests under a host of other conditions. The equipment and systems required to sustain men's lives, to guide and control and propel the spaceship, to provide electric power, to communicate with those on Earth, would time and again prove their mettle. The propulsion system, for example, was burned eight times, and it behaved perfectly every time. The crew worked with a telescope and a sextant, taking landmark and star sightings for navigation, as will be required for lunar flight. they discovered on occasion that water particles which had been dumped overboard could be confused with stars. Care will have to be taken to avoid this confusion on future flights. All in all though, problems were minor and generally were readily overcome or solved. The spacecraft almost seemed to grow stronger as the days went by. But Apollo 7 was as much a test of man as of machine, and human errors were not taken lightly. Apollo 7, uh, Houston, uh, we acknowledge the error on the ground here. Okay, I'd like to have the ground get to work and look at the sleep website. The error had led to an interruption of a sleep period for the astronauts, who were understandably irritated after days of hard work. It was imperative that this situation be remedied. There were also those problems to which man is susceptible but cannot control, like the common cold. Oh, very good. I got a couple of small items for you. Uh, Wally took uh, a couple of items in the active bed. Well, took one active bed only. He feels fine. He just got a little stuffy headphones. And uh, I put some nose grease in mine because my nostrils are a little dry. The side just smells good. As the cold spread to all three astronauts, doctors feared that there might be discomfort, even pain, with eardrums as pressure increased during re-entry. The astronauts were able to cope with the problem, however, by taking decongestants and holding their noses and blowing to equalize re-entry pressures. Always before, we've had to be content with merely listening to our astronauts during their flights. In Apollo 7, through the medium of television, we could actually see them in space for the first time and become better acquainted with weightless life aboard a spacecraft. You're picking up. I can read it now. Just a minute. 
It says, from that uh, lovely Apollo something. You guys should write Apollo it. Rome. High, High atop everything. Something. High atop everything. Looks good. I can see Wally Hamlet now. And Don has a smile on his face, and there's Walt. Okay, what's the next one? A little closer, Wally. So keep those cards coming. Cards and letters cards coming in. Coming in, folks. It's loud and clear. Roger. Good morning to everyone in television land. You're looking at the right-hand portion of the main display console. In the upper left-hand portion of your view, you would see the uh, instruments that have to do with the cryogenics that are used to power the fuel cells and provide breathing oxygen to the spacecraft. As the flight of Apollo 7 proceeded day by day, confidence in men and equipment grew. The astronauts became accustomed to their home high atop everything. They had a chance to evaluate it as a place to live and work in space. There was a chance to photograph Cane Gladys, which raked across Florida and headed out into the Atlantic. There was a chance to photograph areas of the Earth not previously pictured from space. For example, the coast of Chile and the Andes mountain range. The crew could evaluate such things as the importance of exercising. the quality of sleeping arrangements, the palatability of food, seemingly small items, but things of essential importance in a lunar mission. They even recorded the preparation of a drink for a meal. Now we have Tom at uh, Australia. By the time Apollo 7 entered its 11th day in space, it had exceeded the time required for a flight to the moon and back. It was also well on its way to accomplishing all planned objectives and more. Apollo 7 was called 101% successful. On the morning of October 22nd, 1968, Apollo 7 began its final revolution, the 163rd. At approximately 259 hours and 39 minutes after liftoff, the spacecraft propulsion system was burned for the final time, and Apollo 7 headed home to Earth. From motion picture film recorded during an earlier unmanned Apollo mission, we get some idea what the trip back through the atmosphere was like. In less than an hour after touchdown in the Atlantic Ocean, the flight crew emerged from helicopters which had brought them to the recovery ship, the carrier USS Essex. manned Apollo flight can be undertaken with confidence that our brand new spacecraft is, as Commander Walter Schirra reported, a magnificent flying machine.